Okay, and let's go ahead and uh, we're going to stay in television take two. Okay, let's see if we can get this thing going here. Okay, so in uh, chapter one, or chapter one, chapter eight, we talked about uh, attribute sampling and we talked about the use of attribute sampling in our test of internal, co internal controls. And we focused on things like determining sample size, how to evaluate the sample results. We talked about um, having our allowance for sampling risk and our allowance for sampling risk provided a cushion. So it gave us something called the upper deviation rate. Upper deviation rate then was compared to our tolerable deviation rate. And as long as we hadn't exceeded our tolerable deviation rate, we determined that we could rely on the controls. So we stopped there and uh, didn't move on to chapter nine yet. Now we're going to start to talk about how to use sampling plans that will allow you to use similar terms that we learned from chapter eight, but now to determine if we believe that an account balance is materially misstated. So we're going to look at two uh, different ways of projecting the error. One is going to be a classical variables approach. The other is going to be more something that is used more commonly now, uh, something called um, dollar unit sampling or monetary unit sampling, and we'll go through a detailed example. Okay, so that's where we're headed, and uh, we're going to start out talking about some terminology. Uh, some of it we really learned last time, in particular this number one here, which is confidence level. Remember 95% confidence level, 99% confidence level tells you how sure you are that your sample represents the population. And so if we're talking about a 95% confidence level, we would take one minus 5% would equal 95%. If we were to say 100%, essentially minus what? Minus say 1%, that would mean that we were, what, 99% confident. Okay, so the confidence level is what is the complement of one minus whatever percent wrong chances and think that we are giving the wrong conclusion. Okay, and we talked about that in um, our discussion last time because the same thing works, frankly, for any sampling, uh, you can never say, hey, I'm 100% sure, because if you're 100% sure, that means you looked at the entire population, right? So you can never say you're 100% sure in any sampling endeavor. There's always a chance you'll be wrong. And confidence level tends to uh, let uh, us quantify how sure we are in the results of our sampling. Now, we have some other terms here on this slide, and this is dealing with terms that I wrote next to it, uh, what we talked about in chapter eight is it related to our attribute sampling for our control testing. So when we're talking about our um, uh, sampling for our substantive testing, we have something called tolerable misstatement. Tolerable misstatement is the maximum amount of misstatement will accept in an account balance and insertion without determining that that account balance is materially misstated. So you can see how tolerable misstatement is directly related to our concept of materiality. We set a materiality level. We say this is the maximum amount of misstatement we'd be willing to take based on this materiality level without determining that the count balance is materially misstated. And remember, we had a testing materiality that relates to our performance materiality that relates to our concept here of tolerable misstatements. The maximum amount of misstatement we're willing to accept an account balance without determining that it is materially misstated. Uh, now that is um, analogous to what we learned for our um, discussion for our attribute sampling for control testing that we talked about deviation rate, okay? So we talk about deviation rate, that's the amount of deviation from a prescribed control we'll accept without determining that the control does not have operating effectiveness. So these terms are synonymous, tolerable, deviate, uh, tolerable misstatement, uh, and then deviation rate, tolerable deviation rate. Estimated misstatement uh, is the maximum amount of misstatement we think, or the amount of misstatement we think will be in the account balance. It is often based on things like previous experience with the client, et cetera. 
So our estimated misstatement is similar to estimated deviation rate. Now we talked about population and how population will affect sample size for our, uh, for our attribute sampling for our control testing. We said sample size for larger samples really doesn't have, um, I should say a population size really doesn't play that big of a role when we're talking about our attribute sampling, our control testing. For our substantive testing, population plays a much bigger role. And we're gonna see how uh, the size of the population would affect our sample size, particularly when we talk about our uh, monetary unit sampling here a little bit later. Okay. Now, after we go ahead and do our sampling, we'll identify the statements. We will then uh, project that misstatement to the population. And based on that, if the projected misstatement is exceeding our tolerable misstatement, we will have to make some adjustments to the account balance so that the um, we have adjusted below whatever our uh, material, uh, or I should say our tolerable misstatement, which is related to our materiality. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, just show how various factors here affect sample size, okay? And you can see that our confidence level is gonna have a direct effect on our sample size. And this is very similar to a slide that we had in chapter eight, talking about our attribute sampling and our control testing. The more confidence, the larger the sample size. The less confident we are willing to be in our conclusion, we can have a smaller sample size. So you wanna be more confident, larger sample size, less confident, smaller sample size. So there's a direct relationship there, okay? Tolerable misstatement is inverse. Think about it this way. Let's say I tell you that uh, a two cent error could cause the financial savings to be materially misstated. Well, what would you do? You'd say, well, frankly, you should step away from that audit because you can never get your audit risk low enough there. You'd say, well, if a two cent error can cause the financial statement to be materially misstated, I'm gonna have to look at every single transaction. No sample size would satisfy that. If I tell you that a $2 billion error is what uh, the financial statements could still be misstated by $2 billion and uh, it wouldn't change the judgment of a user. So our materiality level would be 2 billion, our material mistake would be 2 billion. And you looked at the balance sheet and you saw that there was only $100,000 in assets on the balance sheet. You'd say, well, where do I sign the opinion? There's no way that there's an error in there that is gonna be large enough to um, change the decision of our users. Of course, I'm exaggerating these just so that you understand the tolerable misstatement is inverse. Very small tolerable misstatement. What happens? I'm going to need a much bigger sample size. If I have a what, large tolerable misstatement, I can probably take a smaller sample size because those errors are so large and I'm probably going to detect them with a smaller sample. Expected misstatement has a direct effect. If I have a client that makes a lot of errors, makes mistakes all the time. Okay, what's going to happen? I'm going to want to pull a larger. I've dealt with this client for say two or three years. I know that they have a lot of errors, a lot of problems. What am I going to do? Pull a large sample size because I've got to clean that up. I got to find all those mistakes, right? And have them make the appropriate adjustment. Conversely, if I've been with this client for several years, they've got big controls, I don't expect a lot of misstatement, I can rely on my previous experience with this client to take a smaller uh, sample when I do my uh, substantive testing. And sometimes students will say, well, what happens if it's the first year that you've ever audited this client? Well, I could take a smaller pre-sample and see what the results are and then use that to uh, come up with my expected uh, misstatement. Population size is direct, and here population plays a much bigger role than we saw for attribute sampling. So if I have a much larger population, I need a bigger sample. If I have a smaller population, my sample obviously is not gonna have to be as big, and that one's pretty intuitive, okay? Now you look at control risk, which I wrote in, I'm not sure why it wasn't included in the predetermined slide here, the pre-made slide for the textbook here, and that this is an important one. What happens, and we talked about this um, in our, um, in our um, chapter on risk assessment, 
in that we said, if I have a what, higher control risk, that's driving up what my risk in material misstatement, that means I have to get my detection risk down. To get my detection risk down, we talked about nature, extent, timing of my substantive procedure. So this is extent. I'm gonna pull larger sample sizes for my substantive testing if my risk of material misstatement is going up. So uh, that also is important. Okay. All right. So that gives you a good, uh, nice little summary here. And this is an important slide. I'll put a big old star since I have this space up here. Okay. This is important. Okay. You got to know how these different factors affect sample size. Any question on that? Okay, good. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at uh, how we might use a classic variables approach to project my error to my um, to my population based on my sample. So I do some sort of audit procedure and I determine that the uh, book value of the inventory is, uh, well, I don't do a sampling procedure for that. The book value is what the client would have recorded in their general ledger or whatever for their inventory. Now I go ahead and I pull a sample and the book value of the sample is 100,000. I then do some auditing of that, whatever. I do some uh, look at the uh, proper value for those items. And I determine that the popular, pop, proper value is $98,000. So I have a, what? I have a overstatement here of $2,000 in the inventory. So I would do what? I would take that 2,000 divided by the 100,000, that's my dollar amount of my sample, and that gives me a 2% error rate in my sample. I then go ahead and I project that by multiplying the 3 million, the book value, times the 2%. That means I'm projecting that there's a $60,000 misstatement in this uh, inventory. Now, this is a very simple example. Of course, I would also want to consider what? Consider the precision. So I would also have a sampling error, a plus or minus amount, and then I would compare that uh, plus or minus amount. How high could the error be? How low, how, how low could the account balance be? How high could it be? How low could it be? That would give me a range. And then I would compare that to my tolerable misstatement to see if I have a misstatement that's in excess of whatever my uh, tolerable misstatement is. Now, this example doesn't contemplate that. When you look at the next slide, note this, that um, they kind of made it easy for us. We didn't have to consider even the, um, the allowance for sampling risk, the uh, plus or minus here that I was mentioning before, because the tolerable misstatement is 50,000. And even without uh, accounting for an allowance for sampling risk, we know that we already have a misstatement that is in excess of my tolerable misstatement. Therefore, we would conclude that the account is materially misstated, and we would start to try to determine what adjustments needed to be made to either correct the errors that we found, or to at least bring that tolerable misstatement down um, below this 50,000 figure. Okay. Question? Okay, good. So that's pretty easy, straightforward example. But let's go ahead. And I think most of the questions uh, that we deal with, well, I shouldn't say most of the questions that we deal with, I can promise you, I'm going to ask you questions like this one that you see on the screen, that are going to ask how those various factors on that one slide that I put the star on, um, are going to affect sample size. So we say number of factors influence the sample size for substantive test of details, of an account balance. All other factors being equal, which of the following would lead to a larger sample size? Uh, greater reliance on analytical procedure. Let's think about that for a second. When we talk about our substantive, When we've talked about our substantive testing, and you've seen this before, okay, and I represented it with a rectangle, right? 
we can fill up that substantive testing that we do with two types of testing. One is a test of details. <clears throat> okay. The other is going to be what? Is going to be analytical procedure. Okay. The rest of this, uh, I'll, I know what I'll do. I'll make the thing go this way. Okay. So the vertical line here is, uh, or the horizontal line or whatever, the sine wave is the analytical procedure. The what? The horizontal lines here going this way are the test of details. So again, example test of details would be confirmation of accounts receivable. So we do a test of detail, we send out the confirmation, that's a test of detail. We're not gonna confirm every single account receivable, most likely, assuming I, my client had 10,000 account receivable, I don't wanna have to test every single one of those. So I'd pull a sample, I would use sampling for that. Now what happens if more of my substantive testing is being made up of analytical procedure, then I'm testing a smaller amount of that account balance now using sampling. And so I don't have to take as big of a sample size. In some cases, I'll audit the entire account balance using analytical procedures. And remember, we had the example of the washing machine revenue here um, the other day, or when we were looking at that particular uh, chapter, I think it was chapter three, whatever it was we were looking at there, maybe chapter two, and we were doing what? We were doing an analytical procedure, and um, that was all we used for the washing machine revenue. So there'd be no sampling in that case. So the more you rely on analytical procedures, the, more, the smaller your sample can be for your uh, test, okay? Smaller expected frequency of misstatements. Again, that's my expected misstatement. If I think I don't have a lot of misstatements in there because of previous experience with the client, I can take a smaller sample size when I do my substantive testing. Greater reliance on internal control. What does that tell you? Well, if I'm relying on internal control, what I'm telling you is I think that my control risk is fairly low. If my control risk is low, my risk of material misstatement is low, I can accept a higher detection risk, higher detection risk, nature, extent, timing. Now that means that I have uh, now uh, smaller sample sizes for my um, um, for my uh, substantive testing. So that's not going to lead to a larger sample. That's going to lead to a smaller sample. So you can see now the correct answer, smaller amount of tolerable misstatement. So what's gonna happen, the smaller my tolerable misstatement is, two percent error would make a difference in somebody's judgment. I'm gonna to have to take a much larger sample to find those little errors that could make a difference in somebody's uh, decision, okay? So materiality levels come down, tolerable misstatement comes down, sample size for your substantive testing has to come up. Okay, and guys, I'm going to have to close this. Um, forgive me for getting in your face here, but I can't. Uh, that sun's going to drive me crazy. Okay, all right, good. Any question on that? Okay, good. Uh oh, please don't start. Okay, these uh, thumb drives been driving me crazy all day, so hopefully that won't start. I don't know if you heard that, but it started barking at me there for a minute. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and take a look here. And they want to see for this one, consider each independently a change in which of the following sampling, sample planning factors would influence sample size for a substantive test of details for a specific account. Now here, they're not asking me up or down, they're just asking me, will these things affect sample size? And so if they appear on that slide that we had where I put the star, then the answer is yes. And we had both expected misstatement and tolerable misstatement. Expected misstatement was what? A direct relationship. Tolerable misstatement was an inverse relationship, um, but they both affect sample size, although they go in different directions, right? Okay. Okay, good. Now this one is asking me, hey, do you know how these factors affect sample, right? And this is basically that slide I put the star on in the form of a question. And so increase in tolerable misstatement 
hey, if I say two billion error, I still won't affect somebody's judgment, then I can have a smaller sample size. Maybe I'm just signing my name to the opinion in that case. And what? Increase in the assess level control risk. Control risk goes up. Risk of material statement goes up. Detection risk capacity come down. Nature, extent, timing, extent, larger sample sizes for my um, substantive testing. Okay. Question on any of those? Okay, good. So let's take a look at this um, notion of monetary unit sampling. Okay, And monetary unit sampling is a technique that uses attribute sampling theory to express a monetary conclusion rather than a rate of occurrence. And um, these days it is used more and more by auditors and the primary reason that auditors use this is the generalized audit software packages like idea allow you to get a file from your client you get a file from your client and then you go ahead into these uh, software packages and you enter the parameters that we've been talking about your confidence level your tolerable misstatement you enter in there your expected misstatement. You enter all these different factors. The population side, you don't have to enter because um, it's going to know what the population size is because you're going to give a file of all the entire account balance. And so it's going to be able to compute that. But you'd also be giving your uh, risk and material misstatement into the sample and then it, into the software, I should say. And then it'll run against the entire file of your client's transactions and go and select the sample items and the items that it's going to select are the items that meet a sampling interval so imagine everyone in the class represents uh, a client's account balance okay and you have what you have so many dollars sitting in front of you okay and what we're going to do is we're going to take a sampling interval and we're going to sample every whatever it is an example we're going to look at it's going to be every five thousandth dollar okay and so what happens the more dollars you have sitting in front of you the more likely it is that we're going to select your uh, account balance now we are going to be testing that dollar but we will use this idea of testing the entire account balance by sending out, say, a confirmation um, by testing and uh, confirming the dollar amount of that entire account balance. We will confirm that particular dollar as we go through and do this. Sometimes it's called monetary unit sampling. I've also called it, seen it called dollar unit sampling. Okay. Now, because the larger the item, the more likely it is it will be picked. Dollar unit sampling has a huge advantage, monetary unit sampling, those terms are synonymous, and that it automatically will stratify the sample. Now, remember we said stratify means that we will remember, I gave you the example where we had a population that had some really big account balances and then a bunch of little ones. And I said, well, I'm going to carve off those big ones. And I know I'm going to send out confirmation or do my audit procedure, whatever it is on those big ones. And then I'll take a sample of the littler ones. Well, think about this. Dollar unit sampling is going to automatically emphasize those larger dollar amounts. Um, so I still may stratify to make sure that I get some big ones that I'm particularly interested in. Um, but um, I, you know, do a judgmental selection of some really big ones. I can still do that, even though I'm using monetary unit sampling, but I won't have to do nearly as much of that because this, the dollar unit sampling, the monetary unit sampling automatically emphasizes the larger account balances. Okay, so um, that's a major advantage here of dollar unit sampling. Plus, as I've said, it, uh, it functions well with these automated software packages like IDEA, that sort of thing. You just get a file from your client and then you run, you use a Windows based software to run your um, sampling, your test against that uh, particular account balance. You have it select the sample. Now, disadvantage, okay, is that zero or negative balances will not have an even chance of being selected. What happens? 
if I have no dollars in account, then there's no way that that account will be selected. Meanwhile, maybe there needs to be some testing done on that because it's what the account balance is zero. Okay, if I have a negative dollar amount, again, there's no chance that that particular item will be selected because dollar unit sampling is emphasizing the dollars that are in that account to select those particular accounts. And you can design away from this pretty easily, not a big deal. What I would do is if I had negative account balances, I would test every single one of those. How does an account receivable end up with a negative balance, a credit balance? That shouldn't be right. If it's true that that's a credit balance, then that needs to be listed as a liability. You don't net out your negative account receivable with your positive account receivable and report a net uh, asset there, a net balance of an asset account. If we do indeed do have a negative balance, meaning we owe some of our clients money, that needs to appear on the, on the, um, if our client's customer owes some of their, if our client owes some of its customers money, that is to be on the liability side of the balance sheet, not the asset side. So we would probably check, test every one of those negative balances to see what's going on. And zero balances, I don't know, maybe they have a lot of zero balance items, maybe not. I would probably do some special procedure around those zero. Maybe I could look at every single one of those zeros to see what's going on. Because why do you have a zero balance? What's going on? Was this a client that you've done business with in the past? Now, all of a sudden, there's nothing there. Nothing's receivable from that client now. Is it a dormant account? Maybe that account should be deleted at this point in time. We might do some inquiry, some additional steps around those zero balances. So it is pretty easy to go ahead and design around this uh, disadvantage zero or negative balances. Okay. Okay, good. And you come over and when we're using, and guys, you know, it gets a little confusing. Are we talking about um, Monetary unit sampling, dollar unit sampling, are we talking about probability proportionate to size? And the answer is yes. These are all synonymous terms. PPS is probability proportionate to size, which is saying the probability that this particular account balance will be selected for testing is based on the size, okay? Now, what we'll do is we will come up with a sampling interval and we'll take the sampling interval by taking our tolerable misstatement and we will divide it by something called the reliability factor. Now, reliability factor is generally derived from a table that tries to assign certain factors with your um, various confidence levels. And we're gonna see how the confidence level will affect sample size. And we'll see that table here on the next slide coming up, okay? Our recorded amount of population is then divided by our sample uh, interval, sampling interval, and that then will give us, a notice we calculate sampling interval up here, brought it down here to the, uh, be the uh, denominator in this fraction, and uh, we divided that by the population size that gave me the sampling interval, okay? Now, of course, we've said that what, our tolerable misstatement, as we've mentioned a, a couple of times now, is what is the maximum amount of misstatement that will accept an account balance without determining that it is material misstatement. So we've known that, we've said that earlier, okay? So we go ahead and we take a look at this next slide and this aligns reliability factors with our risk of incorrect acceptance. Remember our risk of incorrect acceptance is the risk that we will conclude that an account balance is materially misstated when, when in fact it is not, right? And so we have to try to avoid this mistake. We want to be confident in our decision. We want to decide, we only want a 1% chance, let's say, that we're coming to the wrong conclusion. At risk of incorrect acceptance, remember we said is a mistake. The auditor, I mean, has the word incorrect in it, right? The auditor incorrectly, we talked about this last time, okay, has the word incorrect in there. The auditor incorrectly concluded that the account balance was not materially misstated when in fact it was. So that's a mistake. And if you want to avoid that mistake, you want to be more confident 
in your conclusion, then you're going to want to lower these chances of these mistakes. So if you only have a 1% risk of incorrect acceptance, that means you're going to be what? 99% confident in your answer. 5% risk of incorrect acceptance means that you're going to be 95% uh, correct in your, um, your, think your 95% chance of being correct in your uh, estimates, okay? So that's how that relates to confidence level, okay? How the risk of incorrect acceptance, now we've linked that up to confidence level. So you can see here, that if you wanna be 95% correct, okay, your reliability factor, guys, don't say, well, you know, reliability factor, where'd that come from? That comes from some genius calculated, this is the reliability factor associated with um, these different risk of incorrect acceptance, these different confidence levels. You would get something like this from the AICPA's audit sampling guide, which gives you various risk, risk factors associated. Um, I mean, it should, should say different reliability factors associated with these different risks of incorrect acceptance, which again is tied back to your confidence level. So what happens? You take this tolerable misstatement, just using the um, you know formula that we saw on the previous page, formula, fraction, whatever we saw on the previous page, you do you divide it by reliability factor, and that now says that my sampling interval is 5,000. I then divide my sampling interval by 5,000 uh, 5, into my uh, population size, 500,000 in that example, and that tells me that what, that tells me that my sample size is going to be 100 items, okay? Now, Let's just mess around with this a little bit because let's think about this for a second. We said that if we had a what? If we had a higher confidence level, our sample size should be larger, right? So let's try it out. If my confidence level is 99%, meaning I'm only taking a 1% risk of assessing uh, of incorrect acceptance, then I'm going to take my 15,000. And now I'm going to divide it by what? 4.6. Of course, I always forget to calculate that ahead of time. So if I take what? 5,000 and I divide that by 4.6. Okay. Um, 15,000, John, divided by 4.6. That gives me a sampling interval now of approximately uh, 3,261, okay? Give or take a few cents. Okay, and then I take that 500,000, the population, and I divide it now by this new sampling interval, three, two, six, one, and that gives me now a sample size of what, 500,000 divided by 3,261 is going to give me a sample size of 153. So you can see how these reliability factors relate to confidence level and relate to what we were saying earlier about confidence level. You want to be more confident larger sample size, right? Okay, so that's just showing you how these reliability factors line up with our confidence levels and how that affects sample size. Now, um, when we pull the sample now, just uh, forget about this now, we're gonna use the, uh, we're just gonna use the information here in the box from this uh, example. When we pull the sample, our sampling interval is 5,000. So we're gonna look for every $5,000 in this account balance, and we're gonna select the accounts that contain each $5,000, okay? That's our sampling interval, but you a start, okay? So just going over to this next slide, we have a random start here of 300, okay? You can't just say, okay, $5,000, and I'm gonna just look for my first 5,000 because that is not a random sample. Remember you said you, you said you have to take a random sample. So you use a random number generator, 
it would have numbers in there from one to 500,000. And then it would come up with a random start. So our random start is the 300th dollar. And we're going to start to look through account balances to see where our $300 is. So we come to the first person, Adams, whatever. Adams book value is $150. I haven't found my $300 yet. So I go to the next account, Burns. I add in $800 and what? Now the cumulative total is $950. That star means that I'm going to send out a confirmation to customer account number two, because that customer contained my $300, right? Well, I didn't have $300 in the first one, so that one can't have my $300. But then what? when I add in the $800, now I have $950. So at some point in the middle of account number two, I found my $300. So I send the confirmation out to that individual. Now I can go ahead and get on my sampling interval. So now I'm going to look for my $5,300. Okay, where do they list that? Right here. Okay, my $5,300. So now I start adding in number three. Number three comes up. No, nope, I've only, and just imagine this $500,000. That's kind of a nice thought. Sitting on this table here, I'm going through all the dollars and adding in the different accounts, trying to find now the $5,300. And so by the time I'm in this third one, I add that person in. No, that's only $2,350. I add the next person in and what? That next person now takes me to my $5,300. So now I'm looking for my $10,300. I add in this next, um, I add in this next one, which is 2,300. Now that brings me up to 9,000. So this one had my now $10,300. So I'm going to send out a confirmation for that one. Now I'm looking for what? Now I'm looking for my $15,300. So I go ahead and I add in this next person. And when I add in this next person now, I am what? I am up to 22,400. Now, a couple of important observations here. We knew that number seven was going to be selected because if I'm looking for every $5,000 and this person is bigger than an interval, then they have to contain that $5,000. So I knew in advance that individual, number seven, would be selected. And when I add that person in, that brings me up to 22,400. So this account contains both my what? Both my $10,300 and my, I mean, excuse me, my $15,300 and my $25,300. Say that 10 times fast. It has both my 15,300 and my what? $20,300. Uh, Okay, so notice what this dollar unit sampling is doing, guys. If you look at the different ones that have been selected, we had what 150 didn't have a chance, but we got that 800 one got selected. We got this what 4,350 got selected, 4,900 got selected, 8,500 got selected. It did what? It automatically emphasized the doll, the larger dollar ones. The more dollars in an account, probability proportionate to size, the more likely it is that this particular um, item is going to be selected. It also is giving me an efficient sample. It's doing a stratification here for me because what? When I send out the confirmation to account number seven, I'm going to actually be testing two sample items, okay, because I'm sampling dollars. I'm not only testing uh, 15,300, but I'm also testing my what? 20,300. That's making this a much more efficient sample. Auditors like that. I'm not going to have to chase as many confirmations here, but I'm still getting nice audit coverage on my dollar balances. So we would continue on like this, and we would be sending out confirmation to these different accounts, okay? Any I have a question. Yeah. For um, customer account seven, when you say um, we're going to be sampling two items, can you give an example of what that would look like? So, um, so I mean, what what kind of an account are we looking at for as an example for right now, and and what would the two items be? 
in the account? Um, so we're saying um, that these are confirmations of account receivable. I think they said that, I, or maybe I invented that in my head. I can't remember. I don't want to... I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah no, that. yeah, no, that's fine. I just, I always, uh, I, I, I have a accounts receivable fetish because um, I was on an assignment where they asked us to look at the allowance for doubtful accounts. So I spent quite a bit of time doing that at, at a couple of big banks. And so that's always stuck in my head. But um, so what we would do is we would send out a confirmation. Okay, we're gonna talk about confirmation uh, in chapter uh, 10 when we deal with revenue here. But if this was a... Uh, do you owe... Okay, I'm back. Okay, I'm not sure why you can't see my screen. It says that I'm sharing my screen. Okay, there it goes. <sighs> What's um, particularly daunting is that the machine that I'm using keeps losing its connection. I have another screen here where I can see as a participant how things look and I don't lose my connection there. I lose my connection on the computer that absolutely has to work and they're both connected to the same internet. So anyway, okay. Um, so again, uh, Dobby, to answer your question, you guys can, you guys can hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so we have yes, no, okay. And um, it's kind of like a letter you send in second grade to somebody you like, do you like me? You want them to check yes, right? Okay, same thing that's gonna go on here. We want our client's customer to check yes. And when they do, that's basically saying yes to that account balance, okay? But that account balance has what? It has my $15,300 in it and my $20,300 in it. So I am literally testing, again, it's dollar unit sampling. I'm testing dollars. My sampling unit is the dollar and this, not the account. 
But when I send out the confirmation to that account, I'm testing $2 in my sample. Okay, that makes sense. Well, you have to send one less confirmation then essentially to a client or to a, uh, an account? Um, well, in effect, I mean, I want to be careful with how I answer that. Um, yes, but if it contained $3, then it'd be two less confirmations I'm going to have to send, right? So it's not always, it just depends on how many dollars are in that particular item. If you want to answer it from how much less confirmation we're going to have to send. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? So if you send a confirmation that has, um, you know, um, more, the, the however many dollars your confirmation has in there, you know, whatever the number of dollars are minus one, that's how many less confirmation you're going to have to send for that. Okay. The transaction was big enough that it had four. And again, what I would do, if I had some really huge ones in there, I'd still send the confirmation out from those. So when we, we used a dollar unit sample to audit the public debt, um, when I was on the assignment looking at public debt, and um, for that particular uh, situation, um, two banks, two large banks take down the entire, um, almost the entire auction of treasury securities. Bank of New York and Chase take down almost all of the uh, auction of treasury securities at any point in time. So we knew we were going to confirm those two. There was no way in the world we weren't going to confirm the amount of outstanding treasury securities that those two institutions held because they're huge, okay? Now, there are other smaller banks that are competitive, and there's a bunch of non-competitive bids there that we did something separate with those. We took a dollar unit sample of the rest of those. So you could still carve out some big ones, and then for the rest of your universe, do something like this, a dollar unit sample, and you're getting a nice dollar coverage with less work in other words not having to send out as many confirmations okay any other question guys these are good questions if you got something else shoot it shoot um, out. yeah just one last question how does risk factor just so i can try to remember this with the visual how does that um come into play here what risk factor um you know like the 4.6 right you had on the previous page yeah, if if uh, we had used the one percent risk of assessing uh, one percent risk of incorrect acceptance, this sampling interval would have been what three thousand? What was it? Three thousand two hundred oh. or something. And so, what would have happened is I would have looked. You've been looking for my what? Roughly about my three thousand five hundred. My my. I would have started on my three hundred dollar, uh -huh. and then. They're looking for my three thousand five hundred and sixty first dollar, my ten thousand, um, my uh, uh, my my. Uh, then I'd add another. The numbers are going to get bad. They're looking for a six thousand dollar. So I'd be I'd be getting to those dollars much sooner, right? Mm -hmm. And so I would start to select more items here to cover every now three thousand two hundred sixty first dollar right as opposed okay. to um, through a bunch of dollars so i get to the five thousand dollar so that's how that would have increased sample size perfect thank you mm -hmm. anything else these are good questions guys okay i'm just looking uh <laughs> Oh, you guys are having a good time behind my back here saying that somebody else is host again. <laughs> um, yeah, for some reason it did that didn't happen this last time, but uh, okay. Just saw if there was any chat for me to consider. Okay, so no other questions. Okay, good. So let's just go ahead then and see how we would evaluate that sample now. And so you start to go through and we send out those confirmations to those different customers. So remember, we had selected number two. 
So we send out the confirmation and maybe the confirmation looks something like this. Do you owe, you know, do you owe $800 for this guy? We'd ask this guy, do you owe 800? And when we get the confirmation, the confirmation comes back directly to the auditor. The uh, confirmation says, no, I don't owe 800. I've made a $200 payment that wasn't reflected here. So what do we do? We go ahead and we find an error of 200. We divide that error by the recorded account balance of $800, and we determine there's a 25% error in that interval, okay? And so we multiply that 25% by the sampling interval, and we project the error to the interval. Remember, in that uh, earlier variable sampling example we looked at, we projected what? That error in the sample to the whole account balance all at once. Now we're doing it by sampling interval. So we're gonna get better precision on the sample by doing it this way, okay? We send out the next one and the guy comes back and says, yep, that's what I owe. Well, if there's no error, there's no tainting, so there's no projected error. Then what? Then we get this next one and the guy, and if you ever read confirmations, if you ever do this, sometimes the confirmations get a little nasty. If there's a problem, they come back and say, yeah, oh no, I don't owe that. Or you guys are crazy because they think that confirmation is coming from the client. Meanwhile, it's being uh, mailed directly back to the auditor, right? So sometimes they think they're talking to your client and they're actually talking to you, You're like, excuse me. Okay, so they'll get a little bit snippy sometimes, especially if there's an error in there. The person says, no, I don't know that, that's crazy. So we would take what? We would take then 100% error in that particular one, apply that, then entire interval is seen to be an error, okay? Now, this is important right here, guys. Take a look. When you have an item that is bigger than the sampling interval, you don't do the tainting calculation. You get strange results if you do that. You simply take that entire error and you bring that to your projection, okay? You have to be careful there. You can't do it that way. If you were to sit here and say, okay, I've got an account balance of what? I've got an error, I should say here, it's 1,600. And if you divide that by the account balance of 8,500, okay, don't do this. I'm just doing this to show you, it's kind of like, you know, here's what happens, here's your brain on crack or something type of thing that I'm doing. So don't do this, okay? 1,600 divided by 8,500 gives me an error rate there of about 18.8%. Um, Okay, if I then multiply that by the 5,000, don't do this, don't try this at home. If I then multiply that by the 5,000, that would give me an error here of roughly $941, okay, which is a crazy outcome. I know that there's $1,600 of error in here. So you don't apply the tainting technique when your sample item is bigger than the interval. If it's bigger than the interval, you just calculate the error, assuming you had an error there. You calculate that error and you bring it directly to your projected error column, okay? And then we finish up this test. The recorded amount is 15 and uh, the client's customer comes back and says, no, I made a $300 payment. That's not right. So we get what, 300 divided by 15, that gives us a 20% error. We multiply that by the 5,000 for that interval. Now we have a $1,000 projected error. So when we add these up, our projected error for this account receivable balance is 8,500, okay? Now we had said that our tolerable misstatement was what? 15,000 for this. So just going off of this result, we would determine that this account balance is not materially misstated. However, remember, we would always wanna add what? Add in some precision, add in some, and I can't get to it, there it is. Allowance for sampling risk, which would put a plus or minus on that. That would give us a range, and then we would see if they recorded account balance, um, a, a range of, of misstatement, and then we would see if the top, if the um, top amount or bottom amount of misstatement was exceeding my tolerable misstatement. Okay, so in this particular 
situation, uh, we would probably conclude that there is not a material misstatement in this account balance. Now, I would be concerned though here, it's not like I would just walk away from this situation. Okay, I would want to consider, well, what happened? I mean, what happened to this one? This $1,600 one? Okay, so maybe I'm not chasing down every single one to get behind what happened, but uh, I would probably want to look at some of these bigger error amounts and try to understand, well, what's going on? What is the control problem? I might want to expand this sample a little bit more, even though it's not beyond my toggle in the statement. As a good auditor, nothing replaces auditor judgment, right? We just don't look at a table here and say, okay, no problem. We might actually start to uh, inquire about some of these to try to understand what control weaknesses maybe led to some of these big errors. So we'll cut back. So when we look at these things, we not only look at what? We only, not only look at quantitative, we also look at qualitative situation. What caused this to happen? What was the cause of this error here? And uh, we might want to then uh, start to be a little bit concerned. Maybe there's some fraud going on here, et cetera. Okay. Any question on this one? No? Now notice here that what, all of these were overstatements? What would happen if some of them were understatements? What would happen if this was say an understatement, so this became a negative 1600? This number is going to be what, smaller, isn't it? So if the auditor gets lucky and the misstatements cancel each other out, take your winnings and go. If the errors mis cancel each other out, then you're saying, well, okay, then my, um, my projected error is now smaller and it doesn't give me as much concern that there's a material misstatement. Again, ignoring what the qualitative aspects of this, well, I still might want to get behind and see what happened. I mean, just the fact that I got lucky and my errors moved in two different directions, you know, doesn't necessarily mean there's no problem, but in terms of a misstatement, uh, it gives me some comfort level. Okay. Okay, good. Now you could also do dual tests, dual testing, dual testing, is dual purpose samples, dual purpose testing is you would maybe look at the internal control associated with the account at the same time that you're looking at the substantive testing. So the way we describe things in the class is first assess your risk material misstatement, then test your controls, then do your substantive testing. And the reality is you'd probably be doing your substantive testing uh, and your control testing, uh, testing operating effectiveness simultaneously. They call that dual purpose testing. Okay. Okay, good. Let's take a look at a couple of um, multiple choice questions. And uh, let's go ahead and do this one first. Okay, this one. Up here, we'll do first, and I am going to put the poll up. Okay, and let you uh, let you go ahead and give this one a whirl. Again, you might need to move your move your little box over so you can see the question. All right, guys, I guess I'm not gonna go to write on that while we're looking at it. So I will wait.
Okay, I appreciate your enthusiasm. Some of you are coming out with that answer so quickly. It makes me wonder, but go ahead. Don't let me distract you. Okay, good. So um, let's go ahead and take a look at the results here. Okay, and um, we got a nice uh, we got a nice spread of um, answers here. Um, so let's just go through this. Okay, most of you chose A, and my recollection of this question is that. The answer is not A, but I'm going to go ahead and do the calculation here. So I guess I got to get out of slideshow. Okay, let's see if they'll let me write on this now. Yeah, okay, good. All right, so let's just go ahead and let's take a look at this one. And what well, we have a sampling interval of 10,000. So I'm just gonna write that off to the side because I now have to use my sampling interval, my calculation. And then I'm going to get the tainting. So I have what? I have an account balance of 5,000. I have an audit amount of what? Four. So 5,000 minus 4,000 gives me an error of $1,000 in this particular one. I then divide that by what? I divide that by the recorded amount. Recorded amount is 5,000. That means there's a 20% error here. So I'm gonna take that 20%, I'm gonna multiply it by, multiply it by the, um, 10,000 or multiply it into the 10,000. And that's going to give me what $2,000 projected error here. Okay. So there's a $2,000 projected error. Don't show me this ever again. Okay. There's a $2,000 projected error. So um, looking, you know, what maybe uh, two or three of us got it correct. Most of us took A as the answer, but that's not the projected misstatement. Projected misstatement is you take that error rate times the sampling interval, right? Just like we did in the example. Question? Question? Okay. All right, good. Let's go ahead then and let's look at this next one. And I'll go ahead and uh, launch the poll again. Okay, you can look at this one.
Okay, some of you are making progress here. Okay, don't be shy. Just go ahead and give it a shot, see where you land. Okay, good. So let's go ahead and uh, share the results. And yeah, uh, most of us got it right, okay? Uh, choice D is the correct answer. Um, what would give broader consideration to the implications of the deviation if it was initially concealed by a forged document. Think about it. Go all the way back to client acceptance. We said that what we want to avoid accepting a client whose management lacks integrity, right? Now we're in the substantive phase. We're way down the road. We're in the testing phase of our audit now. And uh, we're going to be evaluating the audit results to see how it affects our opinion. And we find out that we have a client whose management lacks integrity, potentially if it was the management, maybe it was the employees that were involved. But we now know that we're in an environment where we're dealing with people that lack integrity. That's a qualitative aspect of this finding that would uh, cause us great concern. Okay. Uh, that it was the only deviation discovered in the sample. No, that's probably going to cause, give us a certain comfort level, right? Probably our tolerable deviation rate is not going to be exceeded there. Identical to a deviation discovered during the prior year's audit. Well, I see why maybe a couple of us picked that one because, hey, you know, we would really like our client to start to clean those things up, right? But then again, maybe we have a client that we have known has a problem applying this particular control and we can design around that by doing what? Increasing the nature, extended timing of our substantive procedure. So we're not as concerned about that. Employee misunderstood the instructions. Well, yeah, that's giving me con some concern and I might want to look deeper into, well, why did they misunderstand that? But again, I can design around that in my substantive procedure. But remember, when we have what? We have detection risk, and detection risk could be attributed to a sampling, but it could also be what? It could also be attributed to things like forgeries, and there's really no way for us to really ensure ourselves that we can design our audit uh, around things like for documents, that kind of thing. So this one that most of us got right, D, is the, is the deal breaker. When I say deal breaker, we're going to really, you don't want this. You know, you know in the auditing uh, class, we always talk about forged documents and fraudulent and misappropriation and all this. And it makes you think when you go in, out in the world, you know, you're going to be running into, you know, Al Capone everywhere on these things. And uh, the reality is, in all the years that I was auditing, I never once ran into anything that I thought was a forged document. I ran into some stupid things that agencies did over the years, but uh, I never ran into forgeries. Okay. Okay, good. So let's just go ahead and stop sharing those results. And uh, let's look at this next question. Which I'm just going to go ahead and leave it out of uh, slide mode for these last couple of questions. So uh, let's look at this one. An auditor is preparing to sample an entity's customer receivable for overstatement, a statistical sampling method that automatically provides gratification when using systematic uh, selection is, and that's what we just studied, monetary unit sampling. Remember we said does what? Automatically stratifies the sample, right? Okay. Let's take a look at this next one. Monetary unit sampling is said to eliminate the need to stratify the sample because sample items are selected in probability. Uh, it, well, I put it in probability. It's probability proportionate to size, right? Proportionate to their dollar amount. So the larger the dollar amount, the more likely it is an item will be selected. You're not probably going to be 
and nearly his concern is trying to stratify, try to take off the big ones off the top. Although again, and I'll emphasize if you have some monsters in there, some just really big account receivable, you could still pull those off account receivable, whatever the items are that are making up that particular account balance. You could pull those big ones off, definitely do some testing with those, and then what? And then pull a dollar unit sample, the remaining ones. Monetary unit sampling is sample interval 400 means that what? Every $400. Again, though, be careful. You would have a random start, but when after you have that random start, it's every, in our example, $500, here $400, and so on. Okay. In statistical or non-statistical sampling methods used in substantive testing, an auditor most likely would stratify a population into meaningful groups if the population had what widely variable amounts. So you've got some really big ones and then a bunch of small ones. You're going to stratify that sample by doing what? Pulling off the big ones and then um, going ahead and auditing those and then pulling a sample of the rest of them. Okay. Question on any of those? No? Okay, good. Good work, good progress, good questions. So um, what we're going to do at this point, since it's a nice breaking point, is we will take a 10 minute break. We'll come back at seven. Let's make it the top of the hour and we will Take a look at chapter 10, okay? Okay, guys, see you at seven o'clock, straight up.
Okay, guys, can you hear me okay? Yeah? Okay, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to jump into uh, chapter 10 now, auditing revenue. And so just to take a look back as to where we've been, we've really been in the planning phase, and then we've talked about the testing phase, our, our risk assessment phase, our testing phase, and how we're going to use sampling. And now we're going to start to take a look at specific audit procedures as they relate to accounts embedded in the financial statements. Starting with revenue, we'll look at expenses, we'll start looking at various asset accounts, various liability accounts, et cetera. Now, I think the temptation when you look at this is to try to just remember, this is how I audit revenue, this is how I audit revenue. And the way to think about this is a little more strategic which is how do I audit a particular financial statement assertion? So how do I audit um, the existence assertion for revenue? How do I audit the completeness assertion for revenue, the valuation assertion? If you take that approach and you keep looking at these different um, account balance as a set of assertions, then you start to see the commonality in your audit procedures as you go through the various accounts. And so even though it may sound like it's a unique procedure for a particular account, you're going to see that it's not quite as unique when you look at it from the standpoint of how am I auditing the assertion, okay? So I'm gonna to continue to point that out to you as we go along. The other thing that you wanna keep in mind as you go through this is we're gonna be describing various accounts I mean, uh, various departments, various responsibilities for different people in the organization. And what we're going to want to keep in mind is the reason we have these different departments doing these different functions is because we're trying to separate authorization from record keeping from custody. Remember, we talked about that. Okay. So with all that, let's just go ahead and take a look at um, some fraud risk factors related to revenue recognition. Okay, now the reason we start out with the discussion of fraud is remember, we have to maintain professional skepticism and we know from just, you know, historical events in business and accounting over the years, fraud has occurred more commonly in what, in the revenue, you don't can't even remember reading about fraud in the office supply account, okay, so we're worried about fraud as it relates to revenue. So we talk about some of these things, for example, side agreements, okay? Side agreements are going to do what? Side agreements are gonna say, well, look, buy this inventory from me or buy this um, service from me, et cetera, and you can return it to me for uh, the next, right of return exists for the next five years, okay? Well, if that's the case, then what? that is a potential that the individual is not going to, is potentially going to return that five years from now. So we'd want to be very careful about any sort of side agreement where those goods could be returned indefinitely and that sort of thing, because if they do have right of return, we have to make certain allowances for that uh, right of return. Channel stuffing, we're doing what? You're convincing a client to buy stuff now that they really won't need until later on down the line. And we're trying to puff our sales in any one year by really pushing clients to buy more than they need at any one time. Related party transactions. If we can control a party and get that party to buy more items from us, then we really, if they're related to us, we either need to disclose that they're related uh, or we need to eliminate those transactions depending on how closely we are aligned with that company. Um, so we would want to uh, worry about that. Bill and hold sales, we have a situation where we build a customer and the risk of loss hasn't transferred to the customer yet. It still is uh, related to us. And again, uh, if it doesn't meet certain requirements for bill and hold, uh, then we would... Uh, you know, want to take that out as revenue. So when you're looking at these, the big concern when we're talking about revenue is what? Is overstatement of revenue.
overstatement of revenue is our concern, okay? So if I tell you that I'm concerned that the revenue account is going to be overstated, that's why the auditor is primary concern, what a search been? That's a question. Valuation? Uh, yeah, valuation a little bit. I'm thinking another assertion though. Existence? Good. Existence to me tends to be the more scary one. You know, valuation, yes, but, you know, our price is our price, right? And that's uh, pretty pretty easy to audit, you know, that we've, that we've included the correct price on things. But overstatement, that's a tough one, you know, right? Did we actually have a sale? Do we actually meet the requirements for a sale? Bill and hold. The bill and hold has to meet very specific requirements to be a bill and hold. So that's where we start to get a little bit more concerned. And that I'm not sure who answered the question, but that tends to be what that tends to be the existence occurrence assertion. Good. So when we look at our audit procedures, we're going to see that our audit procedures for revenue tend to what uh, tend to um, coalesce around the existence assertion. You know that doesn't mean distance occurrence assertion. That doesn't mean we ignore the others. That doesn't mean we ignore valuation. That doesn't mean we ignore completeness, but we will be uh, seeing that there are quite a few procedures centered around existence occurrence. The other thing to keep in mind, guys, that I probably should have mentioned before, as we go through, we're looking at revenue. So and we're worried about overstatements. So we're worried about what? Credits to revenue. So what debits would we be? thinking about. If I audit a credit to something, I could simultaneously be auditing a debit, right? Because debits equal credits. <laughs> so what would be the debit? Accounts receivable? Yeah, good. In most cases, accounts receivable, good, would be the debit. And so there are opportunities that when I'm auditing accounts receivable, let's say I'm also auditing revenue. Or if I'm auditing revenue, I'm also auditing accounts receivable. So we're going to see that sort of, if you will, yin and yang approach to auditing these. And so in this chapter, we'll not only talk about auditing of revenue, we're going to talk about auditing accounts receivable here at the same time. Okay, good. So let's just go ahead and take a look at the, um, the cycle here. And so we have our credit sales. There's our they say credit sales, we credit revenue, we credit sales, that's an accounting credit, but then in credit sales means sales on credit. That leads to what? That leads to an account receivable that ultimately leads to cash collection, we hope. Once we have that cash, then of course we will have purchases and we'll audit, we'll talk about how to audit purchases in a different chapter. That'll lead us to inventory. So we'll audit purchases and inventory. We'll learn about auditing purchase and inventory in a later chapter. We're going to be focusing right here today. This is chapter 10. Okay. Now, a notice, guys, that you could also have what? You could also have cash sales. So we'll also see a relationship between our cash and our sales. So yes, we could debit accounts receivable, but we could also debit cash. So we'll talk a little bit about auditing cash here as well in relation to the receivables. Okay. Okay, good. Now, um, when we take a look, we have three types of transactions are typically uh, processed through the revenue process, the sale of goods or rendering of service for cash or credit, the receipt of the cash from the customer and payment for goods or services, and then potentially uh, the return of goods by the customer for credit. Okay. So you take a look. And we have our um, type of transaction, the sale. Okay, the sale could affect our receivables, our sales. And then, of course, when we make the sale, we would also want to set up our allowance for doubtful accounts, debiting bad debt expense, and crediting the allowance account. Cash receipts, obviously, are going to affect the, the, affect the cash. If it's a cash sale, if it's a payment on a receivable, it's going to affect our uh, accounts receivable. And then if we're offering cash discounts, then the amount of cash that comes in is going to be different than the actual amount of receivable as that gets liquidated. 
sales returns and allowances is going to affect the sales return and allowance account, obviously. And then, of course, if there is a return, then that's going to result in a reduction in our accounts receivable if there's a return. Okay, so you can see the type of transaction, you can see that there are several accounts that are affected. And then you can also uh, imagine that you could audit some of these simultaneously. So if you get what, if you get comfortable with the sales, that could also help you with the receivable. When you get comfortable with the cash sales, that can also help you with the cash. Or when you're auditing cash, you could be auditing cash sales as well, and so on. Okay. Now we start with a credit sale and we talk about the credit approval form. Okay. So credit approval is really a form of what? Authorization. Okay. So we go ahead and we get credit approval before we offer a client. And now I'm talking from the standpoint of our client. So before our client's customer, client, when I talk about client, that's who the auditor is auditing here, right? So our client's customer, our client is going to get credit approval of their customer before they offer them credit. And that would be separate from custody and from record keeping because what? The salesperson probably could care less of the uh, client's customer has good credit or not because they're saying they're saying hey as long as i take my commission that's the main thing i'm worried about whether we collect on it is a whole nother thing so we would probably have a separate department that is going to do the credit approval and they would authorize that in some sort of credit approval form or some sort of field in the computer system but we're going to separate that from what from the customer order this although it may not sound like it is actually custody. This is saying, hey, I have a legitimate salesperson here. Um, not salesperson, I have a legitimate, I'm the salesperson, I have a legitimate customer here. If you will, I have custody of that customer. I'm talking to them, sell, selling the items to them, whatever, I have custody. So I'll fill out the sales order. Okay, so that's going to be custody of that particular transaction. But then what? I'm going to have a separate authorization. That authorization is going to be my credit approval. So we've got authorization, we've got custody, okay? And then we will ultimately forward that information to our, um, to our shipping department so that they will ship something, okay? And so that's going to be what? That's going to also be custody. So we have a separate shipping department that sees that order, that sales order and says, okay, we're gonna ship these goods. Now notice we have a what? An open order report. This is record keeping. Okay. So we will have an open order report and we don't close that report as having been, um, having been completed until what? Until the custody function, the shipping department tells us that those goods have been shipped. Now, when we have those goods have been shipped, there's typically a bill of lading. And sometimes students uh, get concerned like, what the heck is a bill of lading? Bill of lading is a packing slip, okay? You get what? You get something, you order something in the mail, and it comes in and that paper that's inside the box is called a bill of, they call it a packing slip, but the more technical term is a bill of lading. It simply lists what's in there. Um, I found a good pair of running shoes that I liked at Dick's Sporting Goods. And I went to the store and I found them and I was like, okay, I actually like these shoes. So let me go online and order a backup pair because the way my life goes, I find something I like and then I go back, you know, two months later and they're out of stock or they don't make it anymore. So I'm like, well, while I know these shoes are available, I'm going to go online and order. So I order the thing and the box comes and I'm like, hmm, this box is a little bit light. And I open the box up and I then get the shoe box and there's one shoe in it. Not two shoes. I ordered two shoes. They send me one shoe. 
And so then I start looking, I'm like, well, where's the packing slip? Where's the bill of lading, right? What is it saying about what they sent me? Because I want to be able to take that back to the store. So then I had to go back online and print out my order and go in. And fortunately, the salesperson was, uh, I think, a manager or something. He gave me a discount uh, for all my trouble. So that was kind of good in a way. But uh, there should be, the packing slip is a bill of lading, which is going to list off what are the items that are in this uh, particular shipment, okay? And I have a hard time uh, getting things received. I ordered some books for my CPA class. Still haven't got the books. The post office says they delivered them. They never delivered them. So I don't know why everyone else orders things online and everything feels great and they get all their stuff. I seems like I never get my stuff. But anyway, let me stop, okay? So we have what? We have the custody, record keeping custody and um, authorization. The authorization was around the what? Around the credit approval. We had what? We had custody of the customer. The salesperson has custody of that customer. They fill out a, a sales order. The sales order does what? The sales order is then going to go to a record keeping function and accounting that we have these open orders. When those goods are shipped, we'll have a shipping document and then that will notify the accounting department that they have to prepare an invoice, right? So they prepare the invoice. This is record keeping. Okay, so we've got this record keeping that's gone on, and then we go ahead and we enter these things into the sales journal, right? And this also is record keeping. Okay, so we've got these different functions, but notice we've separated these things. We've got credit approval. That's going to help us with what? That's going to have a help us with the uh, valuation of the accounts receivable down the road, because if we have clients, uh, our customers, our clients' customers have good credit, then the collectability of those receivables is enhanced by that. So we've got something that helps us with the valuation assertion. We have done what? We have sat here and we have uh, separate custody of the sales order. That's gonna help us with the occurrence assertion because we're sitting here and we're saying, well, look, um, the sale actually occurred because we've got a separation between the occurrence and then the actual record keeping where we start to have this open order report. So we're seeing if stuff has actually been shipped because if it hasn't actually been shipped, then there shouldn't be a what? Shouldn't be a shipping document. And if we haven't shipped something yet, um, then if it's still an open order and we haven't shipped it yet, then there shouldn't be a sales invoice. There should be no entry in the uh, sales journal, okay? So this is just sort of laying out the documents, but I'm also pointing out at the same time how these documents help us with the separation of what authorization, record keeping and custody. And I think I uh, gave you a mnemonic for that. Just keep ARC in mind. And when you look at these different documents, try to uh, help your try to it helps you to understand what's going on. If you're saying, well, are we authorizing authorizing something with this document, or we're we recording something with this document, or are we establishing custody with a particular document? Okay. Now I will do. Um, oh, and then we'll have a customer statement that we'll mail to the customer. That again is a record keeping function. I'm just going to put rec for record keeping, and then we have our accounts receivable. That's also record keeping, right? The accounts receivable subsidiary ledger. And then that should tie up to, uh, of course, our general journal at some point, okay? Now, um, I wanna stop for a second. And I just want to um, get out of, uh, stop that thing. Huh? Then the thing's talking to me. Okay, so what I want to do is stop for a second and just sort of do a little bit of visual. 
with the whiteboard here, okay? And so let's just go through and we have a what? We have a customer that comes in. Okay, I guess I'll draw that person, right? And we get a sales order. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to get credit approval on that. Okay, and that credit approval is going to be marked there that we got the credit approval. Of course, that credit approval comes from what? Not from our sales department. It's going to come from our credit department. So we've gone ahead and we've had our credit department give the credit to allow that person to uh, order those goods and get the appropriate credit, et cetera, right? Now, what's going to happen? We're then going to send that sales order to the shipping department. And the shipping department is going to do what? They're going to get that. And of course, they're going to actually ship the goods. Or, you know, if the guy's there, they'll bring the stuff out to them, whatever. But we've got a separate shipping department that is going to ship those goods out. So they will prepare what? They will prepare a shipping dock. Okay, now of course we have to do some record keeping here. Okay, so this is what? This is custody. That says custody. Okay, that's going to be the custody function where they'll go ahead and they'll prepare the shipping docs. They'll ship the goods out. They have custody of the actual goods. So now we know that's shipped. And then we're going to, in the accounting department, Accounting is obviously what well, record keeping. Okay, there'll probably be a comparison of the shipping dock. And there'll be, you know, there'll be multiple copies of the shipping document, one, two, whatever. Okay, that's different copies of the same shipping document. Okay, but there'll be the shipping document and there'll be the sales order. Okay, so there'll be again multiple copies of the sales order. So there'll be one that'll go over here, one that'll come down here to accounting, right? And there'll be a comparison of the sales order, the shipping doc. And sometimes the accounting department may also look at the credit approval, okay? Well, they'll see the credit approvals on there, but there could be separate credit approval that they might get to look at. But they'll go ahead and from those documents, they will now prepare an invoice. And of course, they're gonna send that invoice along with the goods and the what? And the shipping document, the bill of lading essentially is going to go to the customer as well. So there's also copies that are going to the customer, the invoice, because we want to get paid. The shipping document is going over to them as well. Um, so that that's that bill of lading that I was talking about earlier, okay? So now we've got that invoice. And again, we could have multiple copies, but we'll take that invoice and that invoice is going to do what? Is going to get entered into the sales journal. So all the different invoices are entered into the sales journal. 
And then the sales journal ultimately is going to get posted to the general ledger. That's GL, right? We go from our journals, we enter transactions in the journals. I know I don't have to tell you this. And then we post to the general ledger, right? So transactions get posted to the general ledger. And then the general ledger ultimately is what should be to the financial statements. And uh, I'm getting a little crunched here for space. Financial statement, the one that we're probably talking about here is the income statement. Okay, so we had a customer that came in, we authorized their credit, got the credit approval, we had that customer, we prepared the sales order, sales order got sent to, uh, one copy got sent to accounting, one gets sent to obviously the shipping department so that they know that they're going to ship the goods, they'll prepare the shipping documents, the bill of lading, whatever, they'll send that over to the accounting department as well, so the accounting department can say, okay, we shipped, for what was ordered, we can now prepare an invoice. The invoice then feeds into the sales journal. So we're in the record keeping um, aspect of things in the accounting department now. We're going to enter things into the GL of financial statements, et cetera. And then the customers is going to be getting copies of the invoice, the shipping document as this goes along as well. And then ultimately, the what, accounting department will send a statement. Okay, a monthly statement. I don't know how I want to show that. That statement goes to the customer, right? Okay, so we went through these documents, but I'm just trying to give you a sense of what the flow is. Okay, now when we do an audit, okay, we are what we're auditing the financial statements, but we don't really sit there and just look at stare at the income statement. We're going to do what? we're going to really first see that whatever they're having in the GL is matching the financial statements. You can't do an audit if you don't have a GL. Okay, got to have a general ledger that lists the account balances for the various accounts that constitute the financial statements. And there has to be a connection, obviously, between the GL and the financial statements. So making sure that this all ties together right here is sort of a no brainer step. If I'm auditing a client and they can't make that stuff match up, I'm going to probably, you know, leave that audit at that point or say, hey, you know, I'm going to have to charge you quite a bit to do your accounting for you and then also audit it, right? So assuming that this all ties up, I'm then going to want to say, okay, for the things that get entered, so I'm really kind of starting my real audit procedures here in the sales journal, for the things that are entered in that sales journal that then constituted, which was in the GL and what got reported on the income statement, I'm going to want to test assertions. And so I might do what? I might pull a particular sales journal, uh, sales journal entry, there's that sales journal entry and I'm going to find what? I'll find the invoice. I will find the shipping document associated with that. I will find the what? The sales order associated with that. Okay. And um, I think that's enough, okay? The sale, the invoice, the shipping document, the sales order, I say, okay, for that sale, there of a hundred dollars, whatever, it lines up. Everything says that there was something that was shipped that was worth a hundred dollars. That's what the customer ordered. And then I may even pull the customer statement for that particular sale to see that there was a statement that went out to the customer that said they owed a hundred dollars, right? Now, I do that set of procedures and I ask you what assertion. Existence. Good. I just tested existence. Excellent. Because I got document through the, I mean, I got evidence through these documents and I did a procedure and I probably used sampling, right? I probably sampled a particular transaction out of there to do that substantive test. Excellent. Could I do a control test here at the same time that will help me with the, um, with the existence assertion? Yeah. 
What would be a control test? Um, making sure there's a separation of duties. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I could at the same time, what? look to see who controls these various documents or you sit here and you say well john what if it's not um you know a paper audit what if it's an automated system well i might look to make sure that the and i probably would go to the it security officer and ask for a listing of the rights that different people have in this system can the same person issue a sales order and then uh cause the goods to be shipped no, I'd want what two different people that release one person that puts in the sales order, another one that what has the right to actually have goods released. And then what a person that can get the goods released should not also have the authority to make entries into the sales journal, right? The same person who can make entries into the sales journal, I'm jumping ahead a little bit to the collection now, but that individual that um, has the authority to make entries into the sales journal record keeping should not also have the custody of what? Of checks and whatnot that come in for payment. You say, well, what if it's not a check? Well, I shouldn't be able to uh, basically um, affect deposits out of my uh, into my accounts, into my bank accounts, uh, even if it's an electronic funds transfer, something that's coming from the customer. So good, I would do a, a separation of duty, okay? Now the other dual purpose test I might do, although it wouldn't necessarily help me with the uh, existence assertion, would be to do a credit approval check. So I would look to see if there's credit approval on there to help me with the valuation assertion, okay? So we're sort of looking at the assertion and we're selecting audit procedures, right? Now, let's say I have another invoice here and I find a shipping document. This is for a different transaction. We'll say this is a shipping document now for 500. This is shipping doc, SD is shipping doc. And I go and I find the invoice for 500. And I then try to find the customer order that said 500. That's a customer order, a CO. I take all of these things, the customer order, the invoice, the shipping document, and I take it back to the sales journal. What assertion is that? Completeness. That's going to help me with completeness, right? If I can't find it in there, then there's a missing sale. Well, you ship these goods. How come you didn't um, record that as a sale? Good, James. And then again, I could look at the controls at the same time as I'm now over this whole process as I'm going through and uh, auditing the completeness assertion and so on. Okay, so gosh, I look at this thing. I'm like, holy Toledo, what a mess here, right? But the, the key point here is we give you all these documents, and I know when you're first looking at auditing, it tends to choke off the mind of, well, why am I to happen to know all these documents? And I want you to start to think about this. Well, yes, I have these documents, but how will these documents or information in an automated system allow me to what? Uh, to satisfy myself that there's sufficient evidence to support an assertion. That's the way you look at these different documents. Okay. Okay, good. So just to just wanted to lift up from this sort of uh, you know laundry listing of the if you if you will of these different documents that we're talking about. Okay. Now um, when we have then the account receivable. There will be what there'll be cash that will come in again, we will want to have that. Um, um, separate this cash receipts journal is record keeping. Okay, the cash receipts journal as we have receipts come in and we will want to have. Authorization.
God, that's hard to write. We want to have authorization for what? For a credit memo. Credit memo says that the goods were returned. And the reason they call it a credit memo is because when we make the sale, we'll do what? Well, debit accounts receivable. Um, and credit sales. But if the person returns the goods, then what's going to happen? I'm going to debit sales. Or I'll debit sales returns, either one. And then I will credit accounts receivable. So they call it a credit memo because what? I'm sitting here and I'm crediting accounts receivable. Now, we don't want the same person who actually has what? The responsibility for the custody of the cash. And that's probably going to be our cashier. Okay. Somebody who has actual custody of the cash. We're going to separate what? The custody from the authorization for something like a credit memo from the record keeping, the actual entry in the cash receipts journal. Because think about it, if we didn't do that, what would happen? Well, now we'd be in a situation where the person could get the cash, go ahead and do what? Um, not make any entry in the cash receipts journal at all because they know they stole the cash and then issue a credit memo. And now the company's none the wiser. They're not expecting that cash to be collected to begin with because we've already what liquidated the receivable, right? And so you'd want to separate again for the cash collection part of the cycle, the credit sale, you'd want to separate the what cashier from the uh, authorization issue credit memos from the record keeping that goes into the cash receipts journal. Okay. Now, if I'm looking for a uh, completeness of sales, I could do what? If it's a cash sale, I could look into the, um, the, uh, if it's a cash sale, I could look in the cash receipts journal and do what? Look to see, and I could still do the same thing with the invoices and whatnot for, uh, for cash sales, but I'd also want to look at the cash receipts journal to see in the complete assertion if there was a cash receipt for sale, did it get booked into the sales journal as well? Or for existence of a cash sale, I could look in somewhere in the cash, um, the sales journal would indicate that that's a cash sale and see that there was also an entry in the what? In the cash receipts journal, that would be the existence assertion for cash sales. Okay, so again, as you look at these different procedures and you think about these different procedures, it's all about what assertion am I auditing that will help give me evidence in support of that assertion. Okay, now if there's a write off of an uncollectible receivable, that is an authorization. That authorization really has to happen at a high level of the organization, the treasurer. Again, we want somebody that will authorize that write-off and then that write-off is done in the accounting department with uh, the appropriate record keeping and we would separate that authorization. Again, you don't want your cashier to have the ability to authorize a write-off because they'll write off the receivable and keep the cash when the customer pays. And if you also give them record keeping responsibility, so you want to separate the ability to write off. That's a treasurer function. Okay. All right, so this is probably a really important slide right here. Okay, so you really want to take a look at this slide because I think it does a nice job of talking about the various functions. Okay, we can kind of almost by analogy think about the different documents that we were talking about here. And then it gives you the various departments. And so it gives you a nice separation of duties is what you're trying to accomplish. And you're trying to separate what let's just write that down here on this slide too you're trying to separate authorization my pen is just really jacking things up here today okay 
Authorization. I never had good writing, and this doesn't help. Record keeping. And custody. And again, you can remember that by using that mnemonic. Okay, great. By using that mnemonic arc. Okay. Any question? Okay, good. Let's go ahead then and let's take a look at the major functions here. And this really summarizes what I was talking about before. Um, but let's see if we can uh, put an A, a C, or an R next to these. So what do you think about order entry, acceptance of the customer order? Is that authorization, record keeping, or custody? Record keeping? Yeah, it kind of sounds like record keeping. Um, I'm thinking it's custody though, okay? It could be sort of seen, and this gets a little bit more artistic at some point. It could also be seen as authorization because I, what, I have an actual customer that's here. So I think what I'll do is I'll put the A bigger, okay? I think it's more authorization. There's a legitimate customer, but I'm gonna kind of put a small C here because I may be like, hey, this is a real customer. Here's a customer. If you're at Best Buy or something, the salesperson is going to do what? They're going to hand you the phone or I'm taking a phone because you sometimes you get your phone at Best Buy, whatever they're handing you. So they kind of have custody of the good. They have custody of the customer, but they're authorizing that there's a real customer there. They enter that sales order, right? Credit authorization is what obviously authorization okay how about and notice we separate you're saying but john order entry you know you're kind of putting that little c there because you're saying it's kind of a custody you say you know entering the sales or acceptance of the customer order is authorization so why do we need another authorization because we're trying to separate the what function of making the sale from the function of um approving the credit right okay Okay, good. How about shipping? Custody. Good, custody. Good. How about billing? Record keeping. How about cash receipt? Yeah, that's going to be what? Custody of the cash, but handling the accounts receivable, subsidiary ledger, and the general ledger are going to be. Um, Record keeping, probably done in the accounting department. Okay. Okay, good. Now we come over and um, I'm not going to go back through these. It's, uh, you know, this starts to get a little redundant, guys. Sorry. You know, the major functions you enter the order, that's what authorization. You do the credit authorization. So that this was prettier than that thing I drew earlier, but it's basically doing the same thing, right? Credit authorization, shipping, then what? Then we go ahead, we bill the customer, we come up with the proper invoice. Okay, and then what? Then that's going to basically go into the accounts receivable, and then hopefully eventually the customer account receivable then will feed in account receivable. This is at the subsidiary ledger level okay so when we say account receivable this is probably my subsidiary ledger i'm just going to write sub that's probably my subsidiary ledger and then i go what i go from my uh, led subsidiary ledger and that should roll up to my general ledger right and then as the cash receipts come in of course i'll credit the customer's account that's why they call it a credit memo because when i first teach accounting i have i had a hard time trying to explain the you know students why 
when you decrease cash, you credit it. They're like, no, no, no. When you credit cash, that increases it. And I have to explain to them, well, the bank is describing what? They're describing their accounting to you. They're saying that, hey, they debited their cash and credited the liability that they have to you for their deposits, right? So um, a credit memo here is describing the what? It's describing the company's accounts and they're crediting their, their customer's account when the cash, is, uh, cash receipt is uh, liquidated, when the accounts receivable is liquidated, I should say, through the uh, payment and the, um, their course they're gonna debit the cash. Okay. Okay, good. So we would be looking for these controls, the what the credit approval, the separation of duty, et cetera, right? But don't forget you also have to consider inherent risk, right? Because we're doing a risk assessment and we're sort of doing a dual purpose test, and then we're looking at the separation of duty, we're looking for the credit approval at the same time that we're actually auditing the dollar amounts on those transactions to help us get substantive testing evidence around our assertions, but we do have to consider what the inherent risks such as industry related factors. Is this company in a particular competitive environment, uh, complexity, I don't know, contentiousness of revenue? I don't know, I don't, I, you know, FASB came out with a pretty good um, standard there, uh, accounting standard codification uh, 606, we take topic 606, that um, really does quite a bit of discussion about uh, the revenue recognition criteria. So I don't know how contentious it is. Complexity, yeah, okay, there could be complexity around it. Um, for example, if I am, um, say, Uber, since I'm not actually the principal, I'm more of an agent that hooks up the passenger with the driver, okay, only part of the total a fee that gets paid is in my control. I mean, cities determine how much you can charge somebody for a ride from point A to point B. And if the city says, hey, it's $20, well, Uber is not in control of that. So Uber would be really more of an agent. So if Uber charges a $2 fee to that driver, to hook them up with the customer, then Uber's sale is $2. Their cost of goods sold may be zero in that case. And they have what, probably 100% gross profit. As opposed to if I'm Nordstrom, where I get the goods first, and then I have custody of the goods. And if there's a you know fire or something, I lose my inventory. Well, now I'm in charge of what? of that whole, and I'll just stick with the $20 sale, the $20 sale, I'm what, I am um, then gonna take my cost of goods sold and make this up $15 and I got a gross profit here now of $5. So you can see that uh, how the client writes its terms, its conditions and terms has a big deal with how they actually recognize the revenue. So. Yeah, you could have something that's a little bit more complex, having to understand industry related factors. All of that goes into your assessment of your inherent risk, right? Okay, but I don't know contentious, I don't know that I agree with it because the revenue recognition standard now did a pretty good job of trying to uh, provide us pretty good guidance that deals with these different types of transactions and how, um, what evidence to look for to see how they should be treated. Okay, control risk, okay, understand the documentation, plan and form your tested controls on revenues, and set and document the control risk for the revenue process. Okay, so um, taking a look at the occurrence, okay, and when we look at occurrence, we're uh, worried about fictitious sales. They record the sale, but the goods were never shipped, or what? Um, there were, um, the, they record the revenue, but the goods were not shipped, or there could be a return and the return is never booked, okay? 
So I'm putting this back up because we talked about this back when we were talking about risk assessment and it was particular to the uh, sales uh, at that time. And so now since we're actually talking about sales, let's just take a look. You have your sale. You can audit account receivable as a related account simultaneously. So you, while you're getting evidence about sales, you're getting evidence about accounts receivable and vice versa. Remember, we think about the potential misstatement and notice now these misstatements are sort of what we saw in that previous slide, which is what a sales recorded, but the goods were not shipped or there's a what there's a return and uh, the sales account is not properly adjusted for the return. Right. And right in here. OK, now we look for control technique, control techniques should prevent or detect that misstatement. And in our risk assessment phase, and our risk assessment procedures, remember we have to obtain an understanding, specifically evaluate the design and control, see that the control has been implemented. And so we do that and we say we don't like the design, there's not good separation of duty. When we try to walk the transaction through, staff didn't understand their responsibilities as the credit authorization. What are they supposed to do? So we didn't think the control had been implemented, whatever, right? Then what? Then we come over and we don't test the controls because we assess the risk of return was staying at maximum or control was at maximum. We do the substantive testing and notice I've done a stratification and I've taken a random sample of some, some of the smaller ones. Again, you don't have to throw out one for the other. You could do a combination of stratification and random sampling, maybe using dollar unit sampling, whatever, right? In the second case, and these examples are mutually exclusive, I thought the controls were much better. I had good separation of duty because I had a supervisor calling back the customer to see if they were satisfied with the goods. I had internal audit departments. Remember, we look at control environment. So having a good control environment is important and with the board of directors, uh, the internal auditors reported directly to the board of directors, et cetera. And I did some re-performance here because I want to get my control risk to the minimum. So I did some re-performance. I participated in a few calls. Then what? Then I went ahead and I did some control testing. I took a sample to see if there was sign off on those. So I did some what? I did some inspection, right? That's another control test. I did some observation over here. The person knew their, their responsibility. So I did all those different control techniques, re-performance. I made a few calls and that all turned out the way I expected it to. And so notice that now I still took the large samples um, for the account receivable invoices confirm account receivable. Well, look guys, if there's some big ones in there, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at them. Okay, I always will. I would, it's a no brainer audit procedure to pick off the big receivables, the big customers and send out a confirmation to them, okay? But um, in this example, I said, well, I just did a, a sample of them. And then I went ahead and uh, did some um, cutoff of sales uh, made at year end to make sure that, uh, you know, they actually had, they had those sales, conducted year end cutoff of sales. Okay. Okay, so that's just to give you some sense as to and notice, guys, by then we were in the testing phase. We were doing our control testing. We were doing our substantive testing to help uh, lower our control risk, our detection risk. Okay. All right, good. So again, you can see the assertions related to the sales cycle and I'm checking these and does somebody want to tell me why I'm not checking authorization oh, yeah. dear McGraw Hill authorization is not an assertion authorization is a what is a control function so I don't know why they are putting this as an assertion it's not an assertion the assertions are what existence or occurrence completeness um Accuracy, cutoff, classification, these are all appropriate assertions for the, uh, for the transaction of sales. Um, yeah, okay, so I don't, I don't know what they're doing here, why they include authorization. That should not be here. I mean, you do want to authorize transactions, but it's not an assertion. 
Okay. So again, the assertions line up with what? What should be happening? And again, the way we think of assertions is, well, what's the potential misstatement in the assertion? So then we can look for controls that are prevent or detect that. That's how we make the assessment of the risk. So even though the assertions have written here, always it's having objectives, you should be thinking of these assertions in terms of what would be the potential misstatement and then look for controls that are prevent or detect that. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and um, you take a look at um, this next slide and completeness of revenue. Okay. And with the completeness of revenue, now we're going to go the opposite direction. So we can do some things like what? Find the sales invoices, the shipping documents, and take them back to the sales invoice, right? Maintaining and reviewing the open sales order, okay? So that's a good one because what? We're going to sit there and we're going to say, well, look, um, you know, this stuff was supposedly sold to your customer back in January. We're here in December. How come this stuff still hasn't been filled? Was this really a sale? What's going on? And maybe we're going to want the um, client to take that sales uh, off of their book. So there should be some reviewing and making a maintaining of an open uh, open uh, sales order file, so that if orders are sitting out there indefinitely, um, you know, then we're going to want to see see what's going on with that particular order. How come is it a good that you're having to produce? It's taking a long time. Why hasn't that been shipped yet? Um, something like this is a good place to use data analytic techniques because you don't really even have to sample uh, this to test this kind of a thing. You could sit there and set up your data analytics to look for what? Look for any open sales order that's longer than 30 days or something. Okay, if you're supposed to be turning over their inventory every 60 days, you could set up an analytic that would sit there and see, well, there are any sales order that was sitting open for more than 60 days. So that then you get a listing back of those and you start to follow up to see what's going on with those particular ones. So that's an area where data analytics, um, because of the power that these uh, the software like idea and stuff have now, you could probably do 100% a check on that. You wouldn't even have to uh, sample. Accounting for numerical sequence of shipping documents. So what happens? Let's say the last shipping document for 2020 is 300. What should be the first one for 2021? Not a trick question. 301. Good, should be 301, shouldn't it? Well, what happens if the first one is 305, let's say? What would you do? Look for the missing four. You get into, good, very good. You get into 2021 and you say, uh, excuse me, you know, you're, you're auditing the 2020 statements, okay, in this situation, but you're looking at what? You're looking at information that's supposed to be for 2021 and you're seeing that what everything gets accounted for sequentially. And when you ask weird questions like that, well, where's, uh, you use 300, what happened to 301, 302, 303, 304? And that's when the client says, oh yeah, that's right. Those should have been included in last year's sales journal. You're right, auditor. Now, what did they do? They understated sales there. So you caught a problem with the completeness assertion, but maybe the, and you say, well, why would they do that? Why would they want to understate their sale? Well, maybe they were satisfied enough for their sales for 2020 and wanted to get a good head start on 2021. Okay, so we're calling this completeness here. Okay, and that's under the um, under the PCAOB set of assertions. They call it completeness when you do something like this, a year-end cutoff test for AICPA. AICPA. 
assertions, American Institute of Certified Public Account assertions, would really call out an assertion of cutoff here. So there's a little bit of a difference in philosophy as to how the two standard setters look at this kind of thing where you're doing a test in near year end, you're looking at that last one uh, and following it into that next year to see that there's proper sequence. sequence. This particular thing, AICPA would say, well, no, that's not a completeness test, that's a cutoff test. PCAOB says, no, what you're doing is a completeness test and an occurrence test. You're doing a completeness test for what? For things that should be included in um, 2020, or you're looking at um, the shipping terms, okay? Looking at the shipping terms, what happens if a good gets shipped in 2020, but it doesn't arrive until January of the next year? Is that a sale in 2020? No. Well, it depends. If it's what, free on board, shipping point then it would be a sale but you're right uh jennifer if it's free on board what destination that it's not a sale if it didn't arrive until the next year so again uh under the existence of current assertion you might be pulling some transactions close to year end to see and looking at the shipping terms etc um you know um pcaob would call that well you're doing a test of occurrence AICPA would say cut off test because you're looking to see that it was included in the right year, but it's just sort of a subtle difference in the way the two standard setters, standard setters talk about the assertion that you're auditing. I want you to be comfortable understanding, well, how would you audit the assertion, whether it be called cut off or whether it be called complete in this occurrence? Question? Is this similar like in taxation too? Like it could be constructive receipt if it was cash sale, but like, and then you put it in the following year? Uh, well, I mean, I'm not a tax guy. I mean, so it would depend on whether you were a, um, you know, cash basis taxpayer, or cruel basis taxpayer, right? Okay. Okay. Okay, good authorization of the transactions okay we want to separate that authorization okay so include shipping of the document performing of the services credit risk right that's why we have credit authorization okay and then cut off again i kind of jumped the gun a little bit there i started getting talking about cut off but that's looking at what at documents near year end, right? And looking to making sure that there's proper sequence, sequence of your shipping documents, looking at the shipping terms, et cetera, right? Okay, so looking at shipping documents are gonna be a good way to test that cutoff. Okay, okay, good. Um, you're looking for test over controls for the allowance for doubtful accounts and for what and for uh, sales returns and allowances, which is this slide. I'm thinking ahead a little bit. We're going to get into to, uh, accounting for the allowance for doubtful accounts in a second. But again, if there's a credit memo, okay, the credit memo is going to what uh, is going to have to be properly authorized by and i think a credit memo really should be authorized clearly by someone who does not have custody of the cash right you're gonna have a separate authorization that's something that would even probably happen at the um, treasurer level right so once there's a return and when the goods are returned uh, the shipping department would have custody of the actual return of those goods they would indicate that there's a return but the actual authorization of the um of the credit memo should really be done at the treasury le treasurer level. Once the treasurer authorizes that credit memo, that credit memo and the treasurer shouldn't have the authority to make the entry in the, um, in the uh, accounting records because that's record keeping. Custody was what? 
the item actually being returned. That's happening in the shipping department. Now they're receiving, but they're receiving their your own goods back. So they get the goods back. They notify what they notify that there needs to be a credit memo issued. The uh, the uh, treasurer would look to see that there indeed was a proper receiving report, which is that the goods came back. They issued a credit memo. Credit memo goes to the accounting department. Accounting department is the one that actually credits the account receivable. And of course, there'd also be what? There'd be the credit to account receivable, the debit to sales returns for sales, or sales return. What else? What would be the other debit and credit here? So I'm going to debit sales returns, let's say. I guess I'm just trying to write too fast. It will prompt one of them. Debit sales returns, let's say, or sales. Usually I'd use a sales return account. Credit the account receivable. That's the credit memo. Is there another set of debits and credits that should come in here? Inventory. Yep. Very good. I got to debit the inventory and credit what? Cost of goods sold. Yeah. Excellent. So, what would happen if you did a physical count of the inventory? and the physical count of the inventory was higher than the inventory balances. That might be an indication that what? The company's not booking returns, right? They're not doing this when there's a return. You know, when there's a return, there would probably be a journal voucher, a particular number that a clerk or accounting clerk puts into the system and the system will automatically do both of these things. Oh, return. The accounting clerk says, oh, return is entry number 333. They put in 333 into the system and the system is supposed to do this whole thing. Well, if there's sales returns and the proper documentation, the proper authorization isn't happening and the sales are just sitting, the sales return are just sitting there on the warehouse, and folks aren't filling out the proper documents to get it up into the proper record keeping, then you could have an audit procedure that would what be helping you. And even though you would be doing that procedure probably as part of your testing of the inventory, testing of your completeness and your existence of your inventory, you count the inventory, the inventory is not complete because they didn't debit it back, but that also relates to what? That also relates to the occurrence of the sale because they're not booking returns. Okay, so these things, you know, you can do different procedures for different assertions, or you could have one procedure that could cover different assertions for different accounts. Okay. Okay, good. Um, where are we? We're past, we're turning the pumpkins over here, right? Okay. So what we're gonna do, guys, is one of these days I'll stick, I'll stick with the schedule. This is maybe not a bad place to to stop because I think what we're gonna start to get into in the back part of this is auditing of accounts receivable. Primarily, we're gonna be talking about confirmation of accounts receivable. So we'll start there on uh, next Tuesday. And then we'll just uh, continue uh, on through the uh, next chapter, whatever that is. Um, I think it's looking at uh, uh, purchases. Okay. All right. Questions? Okay, guys. We will see you then on Tuesday. Um, you can... Uh, be looking now, I think it's probably not a bad idea to get into the homework and the quizzes for chapter eight, nine now, okay? Because uh, that sampling stuff can get a little bit uh, crazy and we've covered both of those chapters now. So make sure 
you're looking at those uh, couple of chapters to get through your homework for that, okay? And then we'll pick up chapter 10 and so on next time. Okay, guys, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.